Hi, I'm Andre. I'm a co-founder in Catch a Deal. Being a Tech in Asia subscriber feels like as if you're going back to a community. It actually will expose them to the industry standards, get to know more people, and then get out there more. Yeah, I encourage them to subscribe into Tech in Asia. Hello and welcome everyone to today's online panel discussion on effective content marketing in the midst of a pandemic, where we'll be talking about just that, how to do content marketing effectively during a crisis. My name is Winston Tang, and I'm an editor with the Tech in Asia Studios team. I'm joined today by two amazing guests. First, we have Ayumi Nakajima, country manager for Southeast Asia and India at Pinterest. And we also have Andrew Baisley, my colleague and the newly minted managing director for studios at Tech in Asia. Welcome, Ayumi and Andrew. Uh, could you please briefly introduce yourselves? Hi, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ayumi, um, country manager for Pinterest, uh, looking after Southeast Asia and India. I, I primarily look after the user growth operations here. Um, prior to Pinterest, I was at Facebook, uh, working on sales and partnerships. Um, and before that, which seems like ages ago now, I was working at Nielsen um, doing consulting for F FMCG clients on go-to-market strategies in China and Japan. Um, I have a small kid at home who I'm hoping will not make noise <laughs> <laughs> during this next hour. <laughs> All right, Andrew? Um, yeah, thanks, Winston. Um, I mean, that's why I'm hiding in the office today from my, yeah. my four-year-old boys at home making making noise. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Winston. As as, uh, as Winston mentioned, um, I'm the managing director of Tech in Asia Studios. We produce events and multimedia content. Um, we serve both the Tech in Asia editorial team. We create uh, multimedia content for editorial, but we also serve brands and create branded content and event experiences for brands that are looking to reach the tech and startup community here in Asia. Um, before uh, Tech in Asia, I've been with Tech in Asia about a year, and before that, I was also at Facebook working in partnerships, um, and that's how Ayumi and I know each other. Um, and I'm originally from New York, but have been living in Singapore now for uh, about five and a half years. All right. Okay, so uh, to the audience, uh, of course, you know, in the course of the discussion, if there's anything you want to ask, please feel free to submit your questions in the questions tab, okay, not the chat tab. Uh, we will get to them at the end of the session. Also, uh, I'd like to let you all know that we've prepared a guide, actually, to content marketing during crises, right, during the COVID situation. Uh, it's full of great campaign examples and exactly why they work. Uh, something to refer to as you map out your next steps in your marketing strategy. Uh, I'll let you guys know how you can get your hands on that at the end of today's discussion. Okay, so let's get right into the discussion itself. Uh, COVID-19 very obviously has had many adverse effects on the economy and businesses both big and small uh, have been forced to put in place cost-cutting measures. Uh, but in the context of our discussion today, uh, marketing spend, marketing budget, does that should that also be part of these bad tightening measures, uh, Andrew? Um, yeah, I think um, I think it may be. Um, I think it really depends on the position of the company. Um, it depends on their own balance sheets and their ability to kind of weather the storm. And I think of companies that fit in a few like pretty broad buckets. There are some that are actually benefiting from the current situation. Um, and oftentimes on accident, it wasn't like a strategy because no one saw this coming. Um, those companies, obviously it's an easy decision for them to not cut marketing spend. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there are companies that are just fighting to stay alive and keep people employed. In those cases, I think they probably, there are many that have to cut marketing spend. They don't have a choice. So then where it gets interesting is kind of the in-between situations where maybe you are figuring out a way to make this new normal work. Um, and in those cases, I think there's a lot of data and studies and, and um, past examples that we can look at that show cutting marketing spend may actually be detrimental in the long run for your business. Okay. Uh, Ayumi, what about you? Yeah, I think um, to, to Andrew's point, like for, for Pinterest at least, we kind of fall in that sort of middle middle bucket where, you know, obviously we, you know, we, we do have to consider budget cuts. We do have to look at our, our financial situation. Um, but at the same time, we do see opportunity in terms of, you know, how do we tell our brown story um, in this situation? And I think the, you know, I think the kind of optimistic view of this is that, you know, every time, you know, well, pandemics don't happen <laughs> very often, but every time there is 
kind of challenging situations, which I'm sure every single business fit faces at some point. Um, that also means there's like a new set of consumer insights or consumer challenges or consumer needs that arise from the situation. And so I think the optimistic view of this is that you can actually have, you know, there may be a whole new set of, of problems to solve for and where your business or services can help. Um, so obviously it takes a little bit of time to kind of transition into that optimistic viewpoint, but um, the quicker you can kind of switch over to thinking, all right, like how does our brand or service fit into this new situation and what new problems can we solve? I think um, that can make your money go a lot further, um, even though you know you may have faced some budget cuts. Okay, so optimization of resources and really focusing on uh, you know the most effective channels, I suppose, is the way forward at this time. I think just getting creative too. Um, I, I think even businesses that are doing well right now, and they're, when they're thinking about marketing spend, no one's saying like, "Oh, let's just keep the plans that we had last year." Like, I don't think there's anyone in the world that's saying that's not adjusting in some way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so okay, we've we've established that you know marketing spend is, is really about putting your money where you find the most bank up at the moment. Um, so okay, I want to propose something, right? Uh, I would say that, you know, thanks to its storytelling potential and ability to drive potent benefits in the form of share of voice and subsequently market, uh, I would say that content marketing is an effective way to spend marketing dollars at this time. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Uh, Andrew, first? Yeah, I mean, content marketing has the benefit of giving you control of the message. So you can choose partners to work with, or you can create content on as a brand on your own channels, your social channels on Pinterest, on um, on your Twitter, Facebook. Um, you can talk directly to your consumers on your own blogs and like B2B marketing channels. I think the benefit to content marketing is it just gives you the ability to, it's not, it's not just an ad that's running the sales message in it. It gives you the ability to kind of sit back and think about who your, your intended audiences, maybe what's going on in their worlds. Um, and that's an advantage that content marketing has that some other marketing methods don't have. Okay, uh, are you me? Yeah, I, I agree. Like, you know, there's a strong element of storytelling. Um, so you can kind of position your brand um, to be more relevant or helpful to, to the situation. So like as an example, um, I'm not sure how much you know people are familiar with Pinterest, but it's um, this was actually a great content marketing opportunity for us in a sense that you know the lockdown happened, everyone's at home. There's a whole new set of things, situations to deal with. So you know, what, how do you feed your kids <laughs> um, for lunch, or you know, how do you set up your home office? Um, you know, how do you exercise indoors? Um, all of these like new questions that people yeah. had. Um, and they were everyday use cases that Pinterest could could offer and help with ideas on. Um, so we, you know, we have this sort of um, legacy brand perception that Pinterest is about weddings and you know renovations and having kids and um, those are like the big life moments that you can use it for. But we kind of took this opportunity to kind of still tell a more um, kind of day to day narrative of how you can use Pinterest. Um, or possibly like very mundane things, you know, even if it's about, you know, cleaning your closet or whatever. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I think it is like a good opportunity, like to make sure again, if you're, if you have a limited budget, instead of just blasting out your brand and trying to push like products to people, um, you, you do have this unique opportunity to provide a bit more context um, that could be helpful for the audience. Okay, uh, so going on that note, um, I would say that there are actually three, like we've established, you know, content marketing is probably the best way to go at the moment. Uh, I would say that there are three main guidelines to follow when you're putting together your content marketing plan, right? So we know we want to do it, but this is exactly how we should do it effectively. Um, so firstly, I mean, as you mentioned with interest, uh, they found a way, you know, a niche where the company uh, companies are uh, area of expertise overlap with what people wish to learn or should learn about the situation at hand. Um, so that's number one, guideline number one of three, um, to be relevant to the conversation, right? Don't just talk about things just for the sake of doing it. Um, the only thing worse, I would say, and not talking at all is saying the wrong thing. So, uh, yeah, 
So we've talked about an inclusive example of my uni, uh, but have you guys seen any examples of who is there for a business not paying in the last couple of months? <laughs> um, I mean, do you want to you want to take that one, or should I? Um, yeah, I, I can I can talk a little bit about this. Um, so, kind of making sure you're relevant. I think um, you know it's it's easy for some businesses, harder for others. You know, if obviously if you're in healthcare industry or you know things that are much more kind of closer to the pandemic, it's it's easier to position yourself. Um, and build that pitch. Um, you know, if I use again as Pinterest as an example, like we're not really in a position to um, to talk about like COVID in a very expert way. Um, and so I think like the being relevant. You know, one of the keys to doing that is really thinking through. You know, what are your key areas of strength? Um, in this new context, and it might not be like an exact match um, to the situation. But again, you know, if it is things like you know figuring out, um, you know, what meals to cook for the kids during the day, um, even though that's not specifically related to the virus per se, it's related to people's lifestyle. And so I think, yeah, just figuring out what areas where you can play in and where you do have strength in, and kind of trying to push that out more. Um, and I think the other kind of tip is, you know, if you're not an expert in this area, you can also consider partnering with one. Mm. Um, so, for example, we we know that, you know, we're not the scientific experts on COVID. And so we partnered with the WHO globally um, to acquire content, um, expert content, um, you know, about things of how to wash your hands, like wearing masks, social distance and all of that. And so whenever anyone searches for COVID related content on Pinterest, instead of just showing like a random set of results, we actually um, exclusively and prioritize WHO content to be surfaced so that at least it's still relevant and useful for people who, who do seek that information. Okay, uh, Andrew, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think in the context of, so the world that I'm in is more B2B marketing and, um, I, I think it's very similar in that businesses have to find a way to be relevant but sensitive and like reasonable about um, what their place is in this. Um, and just like Pinterest, where like Tech in Asia is not a uh, healthcare organization, so like for us to go put a bunch of information out about like how to actually physically care for people wouldn't really make sense. But there are some things that we can do. Like if our mission is to grow and elevate the startup community of Asia. Um, this is the type of thing that we can do. Like, this is something that nobody's paying for this. Um, this is something that Tech in Asia is just doing. And it's about getting content out to our community that I hope is helpful and mm -hmm. help startups kind of navigate the situation that they're currently in. Um, so I think we ourselves like try to be a good example. But we have clients that are also good examples like um, Alibaba, there's a great story. I won't go into all the details about how Alibaba almost died like during the like the company almost didn't make it through SARS, and um, there's uh, there's a lot of great like information and stories out there that everyone should go read about how they navigated that situation, mm. and they learned a lot from doing that and like how to operate a business, and and at that time it was a small business, um, and they've started to share that information now, in the context of COVID nineteen and how other startups and companies can navigate the same challenges that they navigated when they were a startup. Okay, uh, so we, we, we started this discussion with about being relevant and uh, the example that Andrew has just brought up is definitely more about, you know, actually the value that you add to the conversation, which I would say is point number two of three in the in terms of the guidelines that you should have, uh, you should follow when doing content marketing. So uh, the example that Andrew brought up with Alibaba, that's very a very obvious example of being helpful. Right, uh, providing practical solutions for problems that have arisen as a result of the pandemic or the lockdown circumstances. 
uh, I would say there's a, there's two other ways. Uh, one is to educate people, you know, to give them more context, uh, a different view on things, get them to understand the bigger picture a little bit better. And a third one is to just simply be empathetic, right? Just to talk to people as human beings, not, not as potential customers or clients or whatever. So uh, I would like to pose this next question to Ayumi. Uh, which, in your opinion, would you say is the most important? Is it about being helpful, uh, educational, or empathetic? Yeah, I mean, probably the answer is all three um, to an extent. Uh, it does depend on, you know, your business's strengths. Um, I think for us at Pinterest, like, if, if, I, if I would have to, like, stack rank, it'd be, you know, being helpful, empathetic, um, and then educational. Um, so, you know, going back to, you know, consumer insights and consumer needs um, and figuring out what it is, um, that you as a business can help them through. Um, you know, I, I saw an example, um, this was from a a the airline company, which I thought was a pretty, I don't, I don't think they even did ads on this. It may have just been organic content. Um, but I thought it was great where, um, you know, obviously airline companies, what are you going to market during, <laughs> during this pandemic? Yeah. You can't do promotions, you know, you can't encourage people to travel. Um, but they, took this opportunity to um, kind of highlight their strengths and their strength being that, you know, they own airplanes. And so they converted their commercial flights into cargo only flights. Um, and they were shipping like, you know, medical supplies to Europe uh, when the situation was really bad there. And they sort of documented the journey. Um, they also donated um, like remaining food inventory um, to certain organizations. And again, they documented that and to share that story. And these are, you know, it's not like fancy marketing, to be mm -hmm. honest. It's, I think it looked like literally just someone took a photo of the situation and kind of um, put it into a Facebook post. Um, but I think, you know, those are kind of like the unique ways that you can sort of pivot um, in a way that showcases your strength. Um, even though it may not be kind of a, a direct, you know, answer to, um to the COVID situation okay uh andrew what about you yeah so i think about it a little bit differently in the context of being a media company um, mm. so we're not a platform for other people's content we create our own content so our primary function is to educate our audience yep. so i think that's has to be a priority for us and we try to do that in our journalism um, and we try to obviously the other parts are important like we have to be empathetic to what's happening in the world that we operate in and the fact that there's a lot of people that maybe are out of work or there's a lot of companies that are struggling um yeah. and we have to like keep that in mind when we're writing about things um but our primary goal is still to educate people um and that also serves as a function of being helpful hopefully if we're doing a good job at educating people so they are all kind of interconnected Mm. Um, but yeah, education is really key for us. Like the conference we had last week, um, I have the, the banner of PDC behind me um, that'll come down in a few days. Uh, it was all about pivoting, it's for product developers, and it was all about pivoting product in the time of pandemic. And that's not about like, how do you solve pandemic or how do you like, cause that's not our place, but if we can help our ecosystem and educate them about like how to make product decisions, like literally in a scrum, how to change their product. That's like, that's our meaningful impact. That's what we can do for the, for our community. Okay. Um, all right. I'd like to bring up an example of a global company, right? So Airbnb, right, is an example of a company that uses content both by and for its users. Uh, something that's very much in line with the company's overall vision of building a worldwide community. So for Pinterest, uh, does it see a similar approach making sense for it? And how would that all help in the context of the pandemic uh, circumstances? Yeah, I think um, with Pinterest, um, obviously the users and, and the content they publish and curate play a really key role in the product experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Pinterest itself, we, we, we're kind of like the skeleton and then you know, the content that flows through is sort of the bloodline of a product. Um, so it's a very essential part um, for us. And I think what we saw during this pandemic is, um, well, we actually hit all time highs on our engagement rates. Um, 
mainly because a lot of people were searching for, for various ideas. Um, and I think the nice thing um, in our situation was that, you know, if I'm, if I'm curating and finding ideas about toddler meals, for example, um, Andrew could also come across it. Uh, and then he could also use that set of recipes um, for his day to day. And so, you know, we call it an interest graph. Um, so for us, it's not about, you know, social connections. Um, it's about um, connecting interests between people. Um, and so particularly in this pandemic where the whole you know, world was going into lockdown, a lot of people were facing similar situations. So the ideas that I find are curated here in Singapore could, could also be relevant to you know, someone in the US or you know, in Japan or elsewhere. And so I think that um, our interest graph was able to play a pretty significant role in driving our engagement to make sure that people were seeing more and more content that sort of resonated to that to their specific needs at that time. Okay, uh, Andrew. Uh, besides these three like points that we brought up here, uh, how else do you think marketing can add value to conversations surrounding crises? I think marketing in general is part of the overall like. Uh, narrative of everything that we hear in the world. So we're constantly um, exposed to different media. Um, we're constantly, and that media comes from different sources. Some of it is content marketing. Some of it is organic content coming from journalists. Some of it is user generated content. Um, I think all of it plays a part, which is why it's so important to like tick those three boxes on being educational, helpful, and empathetic. Um, because whatever you do as a marketer is going to contribute to the conversation. And every time there's a contribution that's going to either be a net positive or a net negative to like the overall conversation. Um, so I think, I think content marketers have an important role to play that maybe it's a little bit beyond their immediate goal to promote their business um, or get the message out about their products. Okay. Uh, all right. So we've talked about first uh, relevancy, finding your place in the conversation, and then once you're in it, adding value to the conversation. Uh, I would say that the last point, also to harken back to what Yumi mentioned that uh, ENA did, um, I would say that it's important not to focus on brand awareness and not so much selling. So what ENA did, obviously they're not selling any seats, right? But they are really putting across the idea that you know they are a brand that cares. They are a brand that's trying to help out during these uh, difficult times. Um, so I think it's very key that brands really let people know what they stand for, what their vision is, what their goals are. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Ayumi, would you say that at this point of time, uh, emotion-driven content is more effective? Yeah, I think, you know, emotion-driven marketing is probably effective in, in any situation. Um, and possibly more so now because people are a little bit more feeling a bit more anxious and vulnerable. Um, like, I, you know, I was just thinking through my like ad experience and I remember in the very kind of early stages of, of the pandemic, um, I remember seeing, I think it was some fashion brands um, where they were still running sort of their normal campaigns and it happened to be sort of sandwiched between two <laughs> two news articles about the pandemic, um, which which did feel out of place. Mm. Um, and so I think, yeah, being able to kind of connect with the consumer sentiment um, today, which is obviously different from what it was in 2019, um, does become important. Um, but I think it's also, uh, to be a little bit more realistic, though, um, I don't think it's the right solution to go all the way into the emotional space. Um, you know, I think you can afford to do that if you're like a Coca-Cola where everyone knows who you are um, and what kind of purpose you serve. Um, then you can kind of go pure emotion play. But if, if like, I'm assuming like many of us who may be in mid-sized companies or even startups, um, you probably still do need to add some of that functional functional element to it. And so the trick is really like how to weave those two together. Um, and, you know, we, we ran a campaign called Stay Inspired and we created a video where, you know, we showed people how 
that people were using Pinterest during this pandemic, but we also tried to add like an emotional touch to it by, you know, thanking healthcare workers and, you know, families, you know, enjoying themselves even though they are in a lockdown. And so, yeah, I think the the art of all of this is just figuring out how to to piece those two together. Okay, uh, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, none of this is easy. Um, I think it starts with like really understanding who your customer is and um, like really thinking about where they are and what's happening in their world. And that just having that like awareness will uh, inject a little bit of emotion into your message, uh, assuming that you're doing that correctly. But um, yeah, it doesn't always make sense unless you have the right brand and the right brand positioning to go out with like an overly emotional message. Um, for example, if you were some like B2B SaaS company targeting startups in Asia and you wanted them to use your accounting software, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to like run an ad that's like, we're with you as you, you know, like, we're like, who are you to be with me? I don't even know who you are. <laughs> um, but maybe it would make sense to talk about like, oh, we can help move your uh, AGMs, your, your shareholder meetings or your board meetings into a digital setting because we understand it's really hard for you to do right now. Um, and that you're actually like solving a pain point that your customers have. Um, so I wouldn't call that like emotional marketing, but I would call it aware marketing. Like you're aware of the challenges that your customers are facing. I think that having that context is important. Okay. Uh, so we've talked earlier about, you know, share of voice and keeping your brand in, uh, in the public's mind. Uh, how would you recommend approaching marketing such that that can happen? Or if you're already there, how do you maintain your position? Uh, yeah, Andrew, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, you have to know what, so if you're talking about share of voice, you have to know who you're sharing with. I think that's an important step um, in understanding what they're doing. And um, and then trying to figure out if there are opportunities for, for you. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying that you have to be ruthless and cutthroat about this, but if you know that maybe your biggest competitor has completely exited the market and it is no longer saying anything. Um, and you have the ability to go out and fill that gap, then it might be a really good opportunity for you to do that. Mm. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think Andrew touched on this a bit earlier, but you know, uh, I would say that, yeah, marketing really is a part of our culture, right? You know, like there's so many memorable commercials and jingles that you've seen and heard over the years that have all played some part in influencing the way you approach life. Uh, so would it be going too far to say that marketing is as important as things such as movies, music, and other forms of art and entertainment in terms of its ability to inspire or to lift spirits up during this kind of difficult time? Uh, Ayumi? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if entertainment would, would be my, my choice of word here, I guess. Um, I think I do agree that you know, in the past, particularly in sort of like a TV newspaper only world, um, you know, having that 30 second commercial that everyone remembers um, was, did drive culture. And, I, and that still remains um, to an extent today. But I think it's, you know, obviously the, the digital, di digitalization, <laughs> it's a hard word, um, has transformed many things. And I think it's, I think one of the things that's changed is that consumers are getting a bit savvier about mm. marketing in general. Um, you know, previously, maybe you only saw ads on TV or on print, um, but nowadays, like, you're literally bombarded with ads throughout your day. Like, the moment you open your phone, you open an app and you see an ad. Yeah. Um, so we're getting savvier and it's, it's getting a lot noisier. Um, and so this concept of just like blasting out communication and trying to do 360s, I think it's, it may be getting less efficient. And, you know, the trend that you sort of see now is, um, and I think it's, it's actually coming from consumer demand, but, you know, people are starting to ask about brand values. Um, like, what does this brand stand for? Like, how does it contribute to society or to the community? Like, what value does it bring? And that goes beyond just like the products or services that they produce. Um, so kind of treating treating companies as almost like human beings mm. um, and trying to assess their personality. Um, and in some ways it could you know make or break a company. I think you know, if you're a small business, um, let's say you're like a fashion business and you know 
you're very passionate about sustainable fashion and that happens to match with a lot of the consumer needs um you know you may be able to go up the ranks and kind of compete against big players because you know you you have that brand loyalty um even though you may not have that you know multi-million dollar marketing budget mm. um but there's also risks right because you if you do play such such like a personal role in the marketing landscape um and i think you know, recent events in the U.S. in particular with Black Lives Movement kind of shows this where, you know, consumers are demanding companies to make a stance um, on what they think of the situation. And depending on how you respond and how quickly you do this, like you may or may not lose a customer. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of scary. I think as, I think as a marketer, like it, it is um, the expectations and the need to be more transparent is is becoming higher and i think i i hope that it becomes you know that has a positive effect um, mm -hmm. but it also means that as a marketer you you do have to tread a little bit more more carefully um you know, i was just reading the news um i forgot what the name oh i think it's goya foods in the us yeah. um i don't know if if everyone's seen some of the headlines of this but you know, apparently the CEO had a meeting with Trump and like praised praised Trump um, for his work, and then all of a sudden, you know, their product sales amongst the Hispanic community went down within a matter of you know 24 hours. And so, it's it's interesting. Like, it's brands are no longer brands and marketing isn't they're not just about the product. It's it's right. really about the voice and you know their opinions um, that they portray to to the world. Okay, so I guess uh, like authenticity really is a pretty big key here. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So I uh, just want to make sure we have enough time for Q and A. So I have one last question for you guys before we get to that. Uh, in one sentence, looking ahead, how should marketers think about evolving their marketing efforts? Because we know things could get worse anytime. We 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 never know, right? Or they could get better. We're not sure. Uh, regarding the whole virus situation. So in one sentence. Uh, from each of you, how should marketers be approaching their plans for the next couple months? Uh, Andrew, start with you. Uh, okay, I don't know if it'll be exactly one sentence, but I think that the biggest thing that any marketer can do is to just stop sitting on their hands. I think we probably, this is obviously like a black swan event. We, it was very unexpected. We, No one saw this coming. So we spent February, March, April, and then going into May, June, now we're in July, we're in the second half of the year. It made sense early on to like sit back and say like, I'm gonna see what's gonna happen. Like, I wanna know is, you know, are we gonna be able to fix this? Is there gonna be a second wave? Um, we kind of know as much as we're gonna know at this point, there's still a lot of uncertainty, but you can't just wait forever. You can't sit on the sidelines forever. And if you do, uh, one of your competitors is going to make the alternative choice. And then you have to figure out like, what risk you're taking by doing that. So that would be my advice is like, it doesn't matter if your choice is to cut spend or to increase spend or to keep it the same or adjust your marketing or whatever it is, but just make a choice, like do something. Do something, okay. My advice. Yeah. Are you me? Yeah, I'd say um, like consumer research. Sorry, that's not a sentence, but <laughs> <laughs> just a phrase. But I think, um, I think we have to think that, you know, our target audience may have shifted um you know again you know consumer needs may have changed and the way people behave on our platforms may have changed and so i think it's really important now to kind of reinvest in that area to really understand your new audience it may be the same people but you know with different needs and different behaviors um and figure out ways to to you know make that advantageous for your business um and one example I can share of that is, um, you know, we've been looking obviously a lot on consumer behaviors on our platform. And we actually saw that people were searching for Christmas content um, already. Um, and this was because, you know, A, most of us are in lockdown or not going out as much. And B, like people just want positive <laughs> things in our life. And Christmas is something really nice to look forward to. Um, so we were able to kind of spin that into a really great like B2B um, narrative where like actually, you know, if, if you're a retailer or a commerce player, like you can actually start talking about Christmas on our platform because that's actually what people are looking for and you can kind of get there early versus waiting until September. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think to, to Andrew's point as well, like kind of being being able to act, react fairly quickly um, will be key as well. So that's a very long <laughs> sentence. It's hard to do in one sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, I, I'll sum it up uh, both from both of you. It's basically about being on the ball, really, really being on the ball and taking action uh, as quick as you can based on whatever insights that you can pick up as the days and yeah days maybe even hours go by yeah okay so uh we're about to get into q a now so thank you to everyone who has submitted the questions i've already seen quite a number uh if you see someone else's question that you'd like to have answered about it we can get to it quicker it will rise to the top and one last thing before we get into q a that guide i mentioned earlier right that has all the great marketing campaign case studies and exactly why they work so well uh well you can receive it after you help us fill out a short survey. Now, the guide itself is free. The, sh the survey is no more than five minutes of your time, I promise. So the link to it is in the chat app. I believe my colleagues have added it there. So please help us out, check it out, all right? All right, let's get into Q&A right now. Uh, let's see, the most popular question has 11 upvotes. So everyone wants this to be answered. Um, Okay, from Aloysius, as you, can, as you guys can see right now on screen, uh, the impact of COVID has quote unquote, forced many small businesses to move their operations into social media, digitization, as uh, Ayumi mentioned before. Uh, with such a la large influx of social media content and Facebook, Instagram, always, you know, the algorithms are kind of like a black box sometimes. Uh, how does a business stand out online? Uh, Ayumi? Yeah, this is hard. <laughs> I don't know if I, if I have... Um... I think... The magic I think one answer. question to ask is what what parts of your marketing has been forced into social media? So a, a really simple example, and I don't know this person or what, what they're referring to in their business, but maybe it's like your events budget. There aren't events anymore. So uh, maybe you're able to reallocate those budgets elsewhere. I What I would do is take like one step back from the content itself and the marketing activation and figure out like, what were you trying to do? So if it was events, are you trying to drive leads? Or are you trying to like generate networking opportunities in your community? And then um, ask, how do you do the same in these new products and, that you're shifting into? Um, and if you're able to do that and then do all the other things that we talked about, like being educational and empathetic and helpful, um, that's how you stand out. I personally don't think that, I don't think that any one ad campaign is gonna like change the direction of a company. That's like pretty rare to happen. But I also think that it's not that hard to be a bit better than the field <laughs> because most people are pretty thought, thoughtless about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next one, um, I'm going to combine two questions, right? First, we have this from uh, YH who asked, uh, how should content ROI be measured? And from what you've seen, what has changed or need to be, needs to be changed in terms of how this ROI is measured. And also uh, a follow-up question as well from Eric. Uh, what's an important ROI or KPI uh, for content that's aimed to address issues surrounding COVID-19? So basically measurement, uh, a question about measurement. Yeah, I, I think for us, um, we've kind of been focusing more on engagement metrics, so I think you know, the actual metrics may probably differ per business, uh, but whether really trying to measure like does does the content we're portraying like resonate? Um, you know, if it's a video, like obviously looking through like looking at view through rates, um, more so. So we're kind of looking at engagement metrics more so than you know how many people have we signed up to the platform because we're not trying to run like acquisition ads um, per se. Um, it's much more of a, a branding messaging that we're trying to portray. Um, and usually with branding, you know, you look at reach and, you know, number of impressions. But in this current situation, when, when budgets are limited, you know that that's probably that may decrease. And so I think, yeah, just looking at, um, you know, yeah, engagement levels um, just to see how, how deeply the, the content has resonated with your audience. Okay. Uh, Andrew, do you have something to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's, um, it, especially in content marketing, some of the metrics you can look at are like time spent with the content. And that's not only videos you can look at for an article, for example, how long people spent with that content. Um, mm -hmm. They looked at it for 30 seconds and left, then it probably didn't do what you were trying to do, assuming you were reaching the right people. 
Um, the other thing that you should do is if your goal is to increase your share of voice, you should be doing things to measure your share of voice. And then the challenge really becomes like attribution. So then that's a bigger challenge in figuring out like what's driving those changes, especially if you're doing lots of different marketing activities. Um, but that's a separate question. Um, so I think, I think like actually figuring out what you want to measure and then taking the steps to go out and measure it uh, is like a really practical thing to do. And I don't, I, the metrics themselves may vary, but um, the, the methods and the actual ROI isn't, isn't that different. Okay. Uh, so thanks for those questions. Uh, next up, all right. So Andrew mentioned, you know, events. That's that's one of the industries that's been hit hard. Uh, here's another one that's been hit hard, travel. Um, a question from Zaino, Zaino Amri. Uh, any suggestions for a travel company who, who got hit hard uh, by this pandemic? Is there anything we can do to keep engagement with the customer going even if the business is not running or going slowly? We actually had an interesting insight um, with travel actually where um, you know, obviously in the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a drop in people searching for travel content and just engagements for that specific vertical had dropped and we weren't too, too surprised with that. Um, but what we found interesting was that I think, you know, two months or so later, we, we started to see an increase um, in travel metrics. And we were curious to know why, because, you know, we were still in the same situation where you can't travel, um, you can't really go on holidays. And so we kind of did a deep dive on like, what is it that people are looking at? Um, and it turned out to be that um, it's more like a daydreaming use cases. So people may not be looking for specific itineraries for like a specific destination, but people were creating boards um, and inspirations around like, you know, the top 10 places they want to visit um, once this is over. Um, we, al we also saw, you know, content creators like changing some of their content to be like, you know, you know, again, like post pandemic, like thing where places where you can go mm -hmm. and trying to push the audience to be more ambitious. So instead of, you know, going to a neighboring island, you may, you know, save up money to go to a bigger holiday um, once all of this is over. Um, so I think there is a, a place to play. Um, again, it may not tie directly to sales um, at this point in time, um, but kind of digging into that consumer insight, I think there is something there where people people do want to daydream. They, they want to think about the future and um, people also want to plan. Like when you plan things, you know, it helps with your anxiety. And so that could also be an area where, you know, you do see ads around travel sites taking reservations for 2021. Um, and so I think there there is a, a, a place to play there. Okay, so basically more along the lines of aspirational, uh, basically to help people just get free of their day-to-day their -day struggles, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's let's move to another one. Um, Stephanie asks, uh, "What are some things companies should avoid doing uh, when doing when doing content marketing during this period?" Uh, Andrew, um, not considering at all the position that your customers might be in. So, travel is a great example. So, if you are a travel like an OTA, you should not be doing a ton of marketing to hotels and airlines right now, trying to get them to onboard to your platform. Um, like just like really logical stuff. Um, so I, I think you should not be doing that. I think the other thing that you should not be doing is uh, unless you unless you have like a very specific reason to do so, I don't think it makes sense to like harp over and over on the fact that COVID-19 is here mm. because we all know it, that. <laughs> so it's okay, like in even in the context of this, like the event is titled like effective marketing in the midst of a pandemic. Okay, we're like acknowledging it and then we're moving on to like, okay, what do we do? Um, but we don't need to sit here and like talk about it all day long. So I think uh, at least what we're seeing in our data is that um, readers on Tech in Asia are not that engaged on content that is about the virus itself or that dives really deep on um, like the actual fact that there is a pandemic. But what's interesting to people is like, what do we do now? How do we move forward? Mm. Okay. Uh, are you me? Yeah, I, I'd agree to those points. I think logic, 
probably plays plays a key role here. Um, and you know, now that we've been in this situation for a few months, um, yeah, I agree. You don't need to like mention COVID every time, um, but you do just need to find out what's what's sort of the new the new insight that you want to to tap into given the new situation. Okay. Uh, let's have one last question. I believe I saw something about B two B. Yes, uh, we've talked a lot about art marketing to B two C, but B two B marketing to so C suite audiences. Do you think this has changed as well? Yeah, I, I mean, I think everything's changed. <laughs> I think the only well, first of all, and this is what I tell all of my clients is that even when you're doing B two B marketing, you're marketing to a person, and there's like. A consumer on the other end then they have emotions and they have you know maybe they are on a reduced work schedule maybe they're um uh maybe they just have to lay out part of their team um you know or they're having hard conversations with your board of directors so you have to like you have to be empathetic to those things so i'll, I'll give you a really uh like a, a real example um we at tech in asia on the studios and the brand side of the business do um outbound sales activities so we'll reach out typically via email to potential new prospects that we might want to work with. Mm. Um, we have adjusted that so that we're really careful not to reach out to businesses and C-level executives in businesses that we know had major layoffs. Like I'm not gonna send an outbound sales email to the head of like OEO rooms, <laughs> you know, which just lost like 80% of their staff. Yes. Uh, Cause it's just not a nice thing to do. <laughs> to even put them in the position to feel like they have to reply to me. Um, so, so I do think it's changed, um, and you just you just have to be like a bit more careful than you probably would be before. Okay, uh, are you do you have anything to add to that? No, actually, I I agree to to all those points there. Okay, uh, thank you, Cassie, for that question. Uh, okay, so actually we've kind of run out of time. I'm uh, afraid that's all we have for today. Uh, thank you to everyone once again for tuning in and for supplementing all your questions. I tried to get to as many of them as I could and some of them were really popular. Uh, like I mentioned, the top question had like chop up quotes. So a lot of people wanted that one question uh, uh, answered, right? Um, so uh, thank you, of course, to Ayumi and Andrew for joining me today and providing all your thoughts and insights on the matter at hand. Uh, to the audience, one last uh, reminder to please remember to fill up that survey I mentioned earlier. It's a, the guide is free, all right, free. Uh, so with that, I bid you farewell. Uh, stay safe and take care, everybody. Have a good evening ahead. Thanks, Winston. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.